Advanced Driver Assistance System, ADIS, is designed to assist drivers to prevent collisions by displaying alerts, providing camera images, or by taking instantaneous control of the vehicle. Maxisys ADIS is the latest example of Autel's determination to provide its users with superior and technology-driven tools, software and services designed to repair the complex systems that are incorporated in today's automobiles. Autel's ADIS technician-inspired software provides multifunctional OE-level diagnostics and calibrations for expansive vehicle coverage with millimeter accuracy. Graphical step-by-step -step instructions and how-to videos provide guided precision for technicians to use Autel ADIS correctly and calibrate successfully so that the vehicle is restored to the right status. Maxisys ADIS. Flexible, precise, and easy to use. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Pete Meyer, Motor Asian Magazine. Welcome to today's webinar. I hope that this finds you and yours safe in this very unique time in our history. Everyone at home is safe and healthy. And again, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. The subject is ADOS. And ADOS is quite a challenge today to both segments of our industry, whether you're in the mechanical repair segment or you're a collision repair specialist, these are systems that are becoming more prevalent as new models are released and uh, posing challenges to both shop owner and technician alike. Today, we want to try to do all we can to answer as many of the questions you might have related to ADOS and ADOS calibration. And thanks to our sponsor, Autel, we have just the guy to help you do that. Now, before I introduce him, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items for you. Uh, first, um, uh, you can get the best benefit from watching today's webcast if you watch on a full-size PC or desktop. Of course, you can watch on any platform that you want. Even your phone will do. But I think you'll get the best results if you watch it on your uh, laptop or PC. Uh, especially uh, hardwired to an internet connection. If you are in a Wi-Fi system, you may find yourself lacking the bandwidth if there are other users on the system to maintain a steady stream, so keep that in mind. Um, about uh, midway through today's presentation and near the end, we will hold two Q&A sessions, so if you have questions, please feel free to post them. We will have someone who's collecting those for us and we will review them uh, halfway through and again at the end. Um, once the live presentation is done, give us a few few hours to get things recorded and back online. Of course, you'll be able to review this as much as you want after the recording is completed, but allow us about 24 to 48 hours to make sure we have the new video up and properly loaded for your review. So if you experience any delays there, that's why. We have to make sure we get the editing done. Uh, we will also make sure that we have additional resources and information for you at the end of the webcast that you can get further information, whether it's related to ADOS in general or the line of Autel's Maxisys calibration system in particular. And finally, this is a live event. If you've ever been with me on a live event, you know that things can happen. So we'll see how the day goes, all right? Uh, now, without further ado, let me introduce uh, an old friend uh, let me bring into the scene George Lesniak. He's uh, with Autel, and he's my uh, ADOS specialist for today. Uh, George, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time to, to be here with us. Thank you, Pete. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, and I know you've got a lot to share when it comes to dealing with ADOS, uh, what it is, what the challenges are, and what the challenges down the road might be. Uh, so I tell you what, I'm going to turn the reins over to you, and we'll get back as soon as you shared your knowledge uh, to walk me through one to see if uh, my first time little process will be enough to make this all happen. All right, so George, it's all yours. Absolutely. Uh, just want to double check, uh, are you seeing my uh, presentation there, Pete? Yes, sir. Uh, awesome. So ADOS is a really hot topic nowadays. You see it in all the trade publications, uh, online, uh, everyone's talking about 
performing ADAS calibration, should we get into the ADAS calibration business? This subject alone uh, could easily fill two eight-hour days for a class, going through all the ins and outs of the systems and the sensors and components and how to perform calibrations. Because one of the biggest issues we face as technicians is there's little or no consistency across the OEMs when it comes to calibrations. They all use different targets for ca camera calibrations, different methods for radar calibrations. So there's a lot to keep on top of. So what we're gonna talk about today is just go through, as Pete mentioned, um, some of the realities of performing ADOS calibrations in your shop and helping you determine if ADOS calibration service is something that you should be uh, looking at adding to your business. So what is ADOS? Okay, ADOS could be a function or a group of functions that work together to assist the driver to help them not only pilot the vehicle, but make their vehicle safer by reducing the number and the severity of collisions. And one thing to really keep in mind, and this is according to NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, is that what we have today as ADOS systems are really not considered safety systems. Although they do help uh, make vehicles more safe, they're not really considered true safety systems because they can be turned off. A safety system like airbags or anti-lock brakes, those can't be switched off by the driver. So until the government mandate in 2023 for automatic emergency braking, um, that, that is when we will start considering these uh, functions that we have available today as true safety systems. But that doesn't lessen the importance for performing accurate calibrations, and it certainly doesn't lessen uh, any liability uh, that uh, may fall upon a shop for performing a calibration incorrectly. So as we talk about this subject of ADOS and performing calibrations, this is, again, it's a real hot topic the last couple of years, but everyone needs to understand that ADOS has been around for 20 years in the United States, been around longer than that in Europe. It's just that in recent years, ADOS systems are available on more and more vehicles. They're expanding in availability and coverage. You know, back in the early 2000s, ADOS systems were expensive. They're only available on a few makes and models of vehicles, and there were options. But my point here is, of the systems that you're seeing on the screen from 2000 through 2008, all of these systems, except for the 2000 uh, night vision on um, the Cadillac DeVille, were calibratable systems. And I don't think uh, many of us can remember performing ADOS calibrations back in 2004 or uh, 2008 when these vehicles were serviced. More than likely because the vehicles were very few and far between. But that's not the case today. Today, there are so many vehicles equipped with ADOS that performing calibrations is really no longer an optional service. It's something that's becoming mandatory for shops of all types. So as we talk about this, and as shop owners and technicians start to consider adding ADOS calibration to their shops, here are some um, details, some analytics, some data to help you answer the question, should you get into ADOS calibrations? We'll take a look at the potential of the ADOS calibration market, where it is and where it's going. So if we look at vehicle registrations, in 2019, there were over 284 million vehicles registered in the United States. Of those, 80% were passenger cars and light trucks, the kind of vehicles that we service every day. So of that, the 227 and a half million vehicles that are passenger cars, 27% or 61 and a half million were ADOS equipped. Now 27% may not seem like a big number, but 61 and a half million vehicles 
is a very large vehicle pool of cars that have the capability or the necessity of being calibrated after performing some very simple services. And we'll talk about what some of those services are in just a bit. Another thing to look at is vehicles equipped with a forward-facing radar sensor for automatic emergency braking or forward collision warning. Back in the 2016 model year, there were only 9% of new vehicles manufactured with a forward-facing radar. But you'll see that each year that the number of vehicles or the percentage of vehicles is continually growing. In 2020, 84% of vehicles sold in the United States had a forward-facing radar sensor that after even minor collisions would need to be recalibrated. And in 2023, with the government mandate for automatic emergency braking on all new vehicles, all vehicles, 100% of vehicles will have forward-facing radar and the need for calibration. But this is only talking about radar calibrations. There are a variety of other systems that we will have to address after collisions, windshield replacements, front wheel alignments, um, chassis adjustments, uh, changes in ride height, changes in tire size, things of that nature. Here's a, I found a interesting survey that was performed for the US collision industry. Now this is collision only. And what they did was they reported the number of calibrations performed in house by collision repair shops. And I emphasize in-house because this does not account for any third-party calibrations, or for instance, if a windshield needed to be replaced and recalibrated, and a collision shop had a glass installer come to their shop to perform that service, that's not really covered here. This is only performed in-house at collision shops. In 2018, there were approximately 300,000 calibrations performed in-house at collision shops in the United States. In 2019, that grew to over 1.1 million. In 2020, it's forecasted to be close to 2 million calibrations. And if we look at the forecast for 2023 with the automatic emergency braking mandate, we're looking at a growth in this industry of over five and a half million calibrations that will need to be performed. So this is a growing market. There is no doubt that there is a potential for performing ADOS calibrations in your shop, but it really depends a lot on your business model, what kind of work you're doing, uh, what kind of services you're performing on vehicles that may drive the necessity for ADOS calibration. So as we look at the possibility or the uh, technical ramifications of performing ADOS calibrations, let's talk a little bit about the different ADOS technologies that we find on vehicles today. Now, ADOS technologies and what you see and how they're labeled on the screen here are more generic names. Uh, vehicle manufacturers have their own names for all of these systems, which makes it even more confusing for technicians, because as you're trying to look up information on performing the calibrations, the procedures or the specifications, Every manufacturer has their own name for something like adaptive cruise control or automatic emergency braking or lane departure warning. So that's one challenge. But there are ADOS systems completely surrounding the vehicle today, helping assist drivers in driving their cars and making them safer in a variety of different ways. But what I find very interesting is all of the ADOS systems that we see today are really just software. So automotive engineers are writing software packages to take advantage of different sensors and components on the vehicle and coming up with more and more sophisticated ADOS technologies. So as we progress and become more advanced, the vehicle engineers are just adapting software and combining hardware components to perform more advanced ADOS technologies. And here's what I mean. So as we look at the different ADOS system uh, sensors and components, cameras, radars, things like that, if you go back maybe 10 years and you look at an, a lane departure warning system that was generally 
run by a camera mounted in the windshield. So that windshield mounted camera was dedicated to lane departure warning. And if the vehicle had adaptive cruise control or some kind of uh, forward collision warning, it would have a radar sensor mounted in the grill and that radar sensor would be dedicated to that particular function. But what ma vehicle manufacturers are doing today is combining the capabilities of different sensors. For instance, using a camera and a radar sensor together to make a more advanced automatic emergency braking system or forward collision warning system. Uh, using uh, short range and long range radars together with cameras to uh, create very high tech pedest pedestrian detection systems, things of that nature. So what this is called is sensor fusion. The vehicle manufacturers are taking multiple components, working them together through software and combining them to create more advanced systems in, for their ADOS technology. What that means to us as technicians in the field, as we, uh, attempt to calibrate these vehicles, we need to do the research on how these systems function. So if we're working on an older vehicle and the lane departure warning system is strictly reliant on the forward facing camera, when we change a windshield, we may only need to calibrate that camera. However, with newer vehicles, and I'm talking most vehicles 2015 and newer, the camera and the forward radar tend to work together. So as we calibrate, even though the OEM procedures don't necessarily require the calibration of both components, when you think about how they function together, it makes sense that if we're going to recalibrate a camera, it might be a good idea, especially from a liability perspective, to also recalibrate that forward-facing radar since they're both looking at the same point a few hundred yards or meters down the road. So it's all these different sensors and components and imaging cameras that we are going to interface with when we're performing our calibrations. Generally, when we calibrate, we're calibrating a component, a camera or a blind spot radar or you know a, a thermal imaging or an infrared camera, a LIDAR sensor, not necessarily the lane departure warning system or the automatic emergency braking system. We're generally calibrating or ad and or adjusting the individual components. So these are just a variety of components that we're going to have to deal with as we perform all the different ADOS calibrations that will be necessary as we service modern vehicles. So what does it actually take for a shop to get involved in ADOS calibrations? Well, it starts with a scan tool. You need a scan tool that is capable of interfacing with the vehicle, communicating with the different ADOS associated modules and able to enter calibration mode. Now here is a very, very important point to understand. The scan tool does not perform the calibration. The scan tool can only initiate a scal uh, calibration. So the scan tool might communicate to a camera module and request that that camera enter calibration mode. It's called a function call in scan tool speak. It performs that function call and the camera will either enter calibration mode or not. The scan tool can't really force a camera to calibrate incorrectly. It can either do it or it can't do it. The calibration is performed by the car, not by the scan tool. So it almost doesn't matter what brand of scan tool you're using, as long as it has the capability of performing the calibrations that you need to perform, that's the first step in building your arsenal of what's needed for performing ADOS calibrations. Next is a calibration frame. Now here we're showing our Autel uh, standard calibration frame, but a calibration frame is really nothing more than something that's going to hold your calibration targets or radar or night vision calibration uh, fixtures and hold them firmly in place to allow for a successful calibration. Now, as we consider what a calibration frame might be, uh, for instance, Toyota, 
their OEM calibration frame is a, a block of wood with a one meter stick of wood on which you attach a paper target. Honda's OEM calibration frame is PVC pipe. Uh, Hyundai Kia's calibration frame is a camera tripod. I'm not knocking those. What I'm saying is a calibration frame is what you make of it. It's something that can hold the calibration targets and fixtures necessary to perform calibrations. Our calibration frame just happens to be built to work with a wide variety of OEM calibration targets, patterns, and uh, other calibration accessories. Speaking of which, then you need all the different targets, patterns, and accessories for the different types of calibrations you wish to perform. Now, here's another area where there really is no consistency among the OEMs. As you get into ADOS calibrations, you'll notice that many of the targets for forward-facing camera calibration look very much the same. It's just that they're different sizes. Well, the OEMs get to choose which targets and patterns they use for their calibration. We'll even see one make a vehicle over the years change their target type. So that means it requires a large number of different patterns and targets to calibrate all the different vehicles that are on the road today in the United States. And then finally, you need your work instructions, the calibration procedures and specifications that you might find in your service information system, whether that's an aftermarket system or OE service information, or in our case, in the diagnostic scan tool. Our ADOS software includes the illustrated step-by-step -step instructions with all the critical measurements necessary to help guide you through the calibration process. So now, these are just some of the, the things that you need, the tools and equipment that you need to perform calibrations. But there's also some questions you need to ask yourself about how you want to run your business, especially as we get into your calibration business. So what systems, ADOS systems, do you need to calibrate? And here's what I mean by that. Um, this question can an be answered differently depending on the type of shop you run, what your business plan might be. So for a, a windshield shop, you may be focused on calibrating the windshield mounted cameras for a lane departure warning. So you may have a calibration system that is leaning heavily towards the targets and patterns necessary for just those camera calibrations. However, if you're a collision shop, your interest may lean more heavily towards radar calibrations or night vision and LIDAR calibrations, the type of sensors that are uh, impacted, um, no pun intended, you know, through minor and major collisions. So when you get into radar calibrations, there's a lot more to radar calibrations than just uh, something like a radar corner reflector. There's a variety of different calibration fixtures depending on the OEM. So for instance, uh, the radar corner reflector I mentioned, it's off to the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, that's used on Toyota, Honda, and many uh, Subaru and Hyundai Kia vehicles. However, there is a device called an uh, adaptive cruise control mirror for calibrating radars on Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, some Mercedes, some Nissan, and also some Hyundai Kia vehicles. Uh, you'll see that in the center of the screen with the uh, crosshair on it. Uh, other radar sensors might be calibrated by a radar plate. You'll see a black plate off to the right of the screen. Uh, vehicles like Nissan and Infiniti uh, use that plate. And that's uh, for Nissans and Infinities that use a continental radar sensor. So as different OEMs change the supplier for their radar sensors, they also need to change the fixture, fixtures necessary for performing those calibrations. Some vehicle manufacturers use a Doppler radar simulator. It's a, a little device, it's about the size of a shoebox, and it simulates the presence of a vehicle in an, an adjoining lane. So devices like these, um, 
allow you to calibrate all the various radar systems on all different makes and models. You wouldn't be limited to just uh, calibrations uh, for you that that would utilize a corner reflector is what I'm getting at. So make sure that as you start researching and selecting what ADOS calibration system is right for you, that it has all the features and functions that will be necessary for your business. Uh, if you're a wheel alignment shop, a tire shop, or a general repair shop, you may be focused more on the calibrations that need to be performed after performing a four wheel alignment or changing uh, wheel and tire height on a vehicle or uh, suspension ride height, things like that. So forward facing radars and forward facing cameras would need to be calibrated after many of those services. So it's not just there is one answer for what you need for ADOS calibrations. The answer needs to be customized for you and your particular business. Then you need to ask, how do you actually want to perform your calibrations? Are you going to do, do all your calibrations stationary in the bay in your shop? where maybe you need a, a more stationary uh, heavy duty device that you could roll around from bay to bay, but you never really intend to take it out of the shop. Well then, a stationary solution might be uh, in your future. Or if you need to perform stationary calibrations, but you also need portability, look for a system that can fold up and collapse, come apart, to allow you to do calibrations in multiple locations. Maybe you have more than one shop. Maybe you service other shops in your area as uh, you're performing uh, calibrations as a third party for collision shops. A portable system may be important to you. Another question for you um, is integrating with your wheel alignment system important? So. Some calibration systems like ours integrate with many name brand wheel alignment machines to allow you to perform calibrations on the alignment rack as part of a four wheel alignment. So you would perform your normal wheel alignment adjustments and roll right into an ADOS calibration and it would all be done as a singular service on that alignment rack, which is already a flat and level surface. Then it comes down to bay space. This is uh, actually one of the limiting factors for a lot of shops today. Do you have enough open area and the proper type of bay space to perform calibrations in your shop? Or are you gonna need to look at uh, expanding your shop or building a, uh, a separate uh, pole barn or something along those lines with a flat level surface? Now, in this uh, illustration here, this is very generic. A typical base space of about 16 by 30 foot would allow you to perform many ADOS calibrations. And that's including forward facing uh, camera, forward radar, uh, some blind spot calibrations, some around view monitoring, some rear collision warning. But there are quite a few calibrations that require more space than what you see here. So some vehicles, uh, Subarus, Hondas, for instance, require that the calibration targets are placed four meters in front of the vehicle, actually measured from the center of the front wheel. But as you can see, that doesn't neatly fit into our 30 by 16 foot bay. So as you're looking through your service information and they talk about bay space requirements, you'll notice that they generally uh, depict the vehicle placed in the center of the flattened level surface. Well, in reality, in the aftermarket, we need to get creative with our bay space. So that may mean moving the vehicle within that flattened level surface to allow you the space to perform the calibrations that you need to perform, if that makes sense. If this was a blind spot radar calibration that might require 15 feet to the side of the vehicle, maybe you can pull the vehicle to the side of the bay if you have enough uh, free and clear space uh, to either side. There's always a way to come up with the proper bay space, but it's important that you have proper bay space. 
trying to perform calibrations on an improper surface, a uh, surface that isn't flat and level, just makes for an improper or an inaccurate calibration. So there's, as I mentioned earlier, there is the possibility of performing your calibrations on an alignment rack. Many alignment racks are long enough that you could actually reposition the vehicle on the rack uh, after you perform your calibration. But one of the limiting factors here is the space that is available in front of the vehicle. Generally, alignment racks are mounted fairly close to a wall, just enough space to fit the alignment machine. If that's uh, the case in your shop, there's a possibility that you won't be able to perform all the calibrations that you need to perform unless, again, you get creative with that space and maybe back the vehicle off the calibration, uh, off of the uh, alignment lift and back it back on the lift to give you more space. Just get creative. Because as you can see here, when we're dealing with uh, that example Subaru or Honda that we talked about just a moment ago, very few alignment racks will have four to six meters in front of the bay to allow you to perform those calibrations in the alignment position. And uh, one question that comes up is, is it okay to reposition the vehicle after you've performed the alignment? Absolutely. The, for the calibration portion of the service, the vehicle does not need to be sitting on the turn plates. It just needs to be sitting on a flat level surface that's stable. So yes, you can back the vehicle up. And if you're using an integrated solution, uh, like for instance, the Autel si uh, system with one of uh, the many um, alignment machines that we integrate with, you may need to uh, recompensate the rear uh, wheel targets and heads in order to perform this, but that's an easy step and it's very simple to, uh, to overcome. Then we come to a round view monitoring. Now, AVM or 360 view calibration on many vehicles is actually simple and straightforward. Most vehicle manufacturers, uh, you could perform in a round view monitoring calib calibration in a standard bay. However, some vehicles, uh, Porsche, as we see here, Ford, uh, some Volkswagen Audi vehicles require significantly more base space. Now, in this example, Ford, these patterns that we see here are five and a half feet wide and 37 and a half feet long. And there's two of them. So this could require 25 by 40 feet to perform this calibration. So again, you, you know your shop you know your capabilities and how much space you have available to determine if this is the type of calibration that you can perform or offer to other shops in your area. Then there's radar calibrations. Now, depending on the type of vehicle and the type of calibration fixture, it will determine how much free and clear space is required to perform a radar calibration. Now, this particular illustration is for a Toyota vehicle that uses the uh, triangular corner reflector. Because of the way the calibration functions, there cannot be any objects of metallic mass in the area depicted on this graphic. So in, th in this case, they're looking for 10 meters in front of the radar sensor at four meters wide, where there can be no large metal objects that might interfere with the calibration. However, if we were performing a calibration on let's say a Nissan or a Volkswagen or a Porsche or Mercedes, a Mazda, um, it uses different types of calibration uh, fixtures and those calibrations can very easily be performed in a standard base space. So what I'm getting at is there is no one answer for how much space do we need. The manufacturer of the vehicle dictates how much space is requ required to perform their calibrations. What I'm noticing is, especially with Toyota, if you look at the base space requirements for a radar calibration, something like blind spot, going back to 2016, over the years through 2018 and now into 2019 and 2020, the base space requirements are decreasing. 
So that's a good sign. Uh, I think it's the OEM engineers are finally starting to realize that they need to create a calibration environment that's more realistic for the aftermarket to be able to perform these calibrations as well. So now that we've uh, gone through the space requirements, let's talk about some of the best practices for performing calibrations in your bay. First, the skill set for a calibration technician. Now, a calibration technician doesn't necessarily have to be the high-tech A-level technician who does diagnostics and you know performs network troubleshooting and those kind of things. It depends on your shop. It could be the technician who just very carefully, very precisely sets up the targets and performs the calibration with the scan tool. But if problems occur, maybe it gets pushed to a higher level tech. Some shops insist on their A-level techs performing calibrations and diagnostics. It's entirely up to you. But here's the basic skill set. Calibration technician must be able to read, understand, interpret, and follow detailed instructions without skipping steps. This is important. There will be little details that may seem insignificant at the time, but if not followed precisely, could lead to an inaccurate calibration. Now, what I mean by an inaccurate calibration is, it's very easy to set up your targets improperly, perform a calibration, and have the, can, the scan tool tell you that the calibration was successful with no malfunctions. But that does not mean the calibration was accurate. The accuracy of the calibration is dependent on the person setting up the targets and the calibration environment. So it's really, really important to follow the instructions provided. So a calibration tech must be able to make precision measurements with a metric tape measure. Every OEM provides all their distance and height specifications in metric values. I know we're not big on metric here in the United States, and most metric tape measures are uh, also provide uh, inches and feet, but trust me, go by metric. It's very easy, very simple to use, and you don't have to worry about doing any uh, uh, calculations or conversions from metric to inches that might lead to mistakes and errors. You also need to be able to utilize a plumb bob in a string line which many OEMs are still using to determine vehicle center line. You may need to uh, be able to create a true 90 degree triangle on the ground. This is uh, very useful when you're performing uh, blind spot calibrations. When you start looking at the service procedures, you'll see exactly what I mean by that. And uh, the ability to be able to draw on the ground with chalk. Luckily, this is one of the skills we learned in preschool, and now it's valuable as we're professional technicians as well. But as you'll start uh, noticing, and as you see at the, the little image in the lower right-hand corner, as you start making measurements on the ground, you're gonna be marking point A and point Z, and you know, measuring between point C and D, and all these points need to be marked clearly for you to make proper measurements, and properly and accurately position your calibration fixture. You'll need to be able to utilize levels, a spirit or bubble level, as well as a laser level, and make precision adjustments to your calibration equipment. Then comes documentation. Well, you know, one of the biggest questions that I get is about liability. And I'm gonna cover part of that here. The way to help protect yourself in the case of a lawsuit is to document everything, everything you possibly can, and don't get complacent. Come up with a process for your shop where every time you do a quick visual vehicle inspection before you touch the car, document it with photographs, do your pre-scan, hopefully the system that you're using will allow you to attach photographs to your pre-scan, for record, record keeping. Uh, make sure you're checking the uh, steering angle sensor, making sure that when you're setting the vehicle up for calibration, that the steering angle sensor is properly calibrated, and while the vehicle is sitting in the bay, 
the steering angle sensor reads 0.0 degrees. The steering angle sensor is a critical input for many ADOS systems. The steering angle sensor indicates driver intent. So if the steering angle sensor is at zero, while the vehicle's driving down the road, the ADOS systems understand that the driver is attempting to drive in a straight line. But if you calibrate a vehicle with a steering angle sensor that's offset at, let's say, 13 degrees, that may signal to the forward-facing camera module that the driver is attempting to steer slightly to the left. That can change the way these systems react. So this is a very important input, and it's a good idea that once you tweak that steering wheel a little bit and get that steering angle sensor set at zero, perform a screen capture with your scan tool and attach that to your pre-scan report as documentation that you were properly setting up the vehicle. If there are any calibration PIDs that you need to uh, capture to show that the, you know, you're performing the calibration correctly, capture those screen captures as well. After your calibration, make sure you photograph things like your calibration setup to show that you're using a proper system. Uh, uh, photograph the vehicle. Um, you may want to calibrate or photograph the, uh, the VIN plate on the vehicle. Some scan tools like ours automatically capture the VIN for you, so that may not be necessary. You'll also want to do your post scan and a complete and documented test drive, exercising all the ADOS systems that you've calibrated to ensure that they function properly. And then of course, get a customer signature on the end of your report. Now, our uh, pre and post scan is combined into a singular report that you can very easily email, wirelessly print, and have a customer sign. Then there's the calibration environment. Flat level floor. Now, this is probably the second most popular question that people ask me. How level does a floor need to be? Well, there are a few vehicle manufacturers that will actually give you a specification. It needs to be within a half, half an inch over the length of the vehicle. Um, some just say level, so you'll have to interpret that. But um, I think you'll agree that most aftermarket repair shops, the floors weren't really intended to be flat and level. Most shops have their floors pitched for drainage. So that can make calibrations difficult. Um, if you attempt to calibrate on an unlevel surface, again, you may complete the calibration, but it will not be accurate. Everything about setting up the target for a calibration assumes that you are following the instructions to the letter. So if you skip steps or don't follow the instructions, your calibration will not be accurate bright, even, controlled lighting. You uh, don't want lighting that's too dim. You don't want lighting that's too bright in some spots, but there's shadows in others. Even lighting makes it easier for cameras to see targets, especially Subarus. Subarus are very, very touchy to uh, shop lighting. Uh, most calibration uh, procedures uh, specifically state they don't want lighting coming in from the sides, and there should be no uh, light behind the targets that could confuse the cameras. No clutter or objects or uh, checkerboard patterns behind the targets. You know, so if you have a shop where you have a lot of things hanging on the wall, you may need to do, a, do something about that to uh, avoid, again, confusing the cameras. And if you're doing radar calibrations, no objects of metallic mass in the specified distance that the OEM provides or we provide on our scan tool for performing that calibration. Objects of mass like a tire machine or an engine on a stand, a parts cleaner, a toolbox can send false reflective radar signals back to this radar sensor and could confuse the radar sensor to uh, cause that calibration to fail, or it could actually calibrate inaccurately. So here's an example of a less than ideal environment for performing a forward-facing camera calibration. In this particular shop, they were having an issue on this uh, 2019 Toyota Camry 
with the sequential target calibration for the forward-facing camera. So here you can, you can see we've got our uh, little checkerboard pattern set in the center, center position, and this particular vehicle would fail every time when we moved to the vehicle right position. And as you can see in the background, there's these uh, unblocked windows on the overhead door. When those windows were covered, the calibration passed. But I'm also concerned by some of the signs in the background that are basically just different colored blocks. Most cameras see in either black and white or grayscale. So some of those like the do not block or the safety test sign, the safety first sign may be seen as a black or white checkerboard and could confuse the camera. In cases like this, you don't necessarily need to move the vehicle to a different location. You just need to have a backdrop, a painter's tarp, uh, a big whiteboard, something that you can put behind the targets. Or maybe you use uh, Toyota's recommended uh, process and have someone hold a piece of cardboard behind the target. Anything to obscure the background from the forward-facing camera will allow the camera to calibrate more accurately. Here's another example. This particular shop, the technician had multiple issues attempting to calibrate this Toyota Camry, but they were receiving failures in the center position. They could never get past the center calibration. Now, as you can see in the background, there's uh, bright windows on the left side where the sun's shining through the bay door. Uh, those windows are also behind, uh, directly behind the target, and that's why the cardboard is set up there. There's a bright light overhead. There's a lot of checkerboard patterns. But um, after blocking out all those items, this particular calibration still failed. If you notice, the calibration target doesn't appear black and white. The cameras are looking for the contrast between black and white in order to perform the calibration. What was happening here is the windows and the bay door behind the vehicle were washing out the target. So what they did was they just took some pieces of cardboard and taped them up over the windows. And when that happened, you can see now the calibration target is a nice crisp black and white, and they were able to perform the sequential calibration successfully without any issues. Next, vehicle preconditioning instructions. Now in your service information systems or your uh, OE information, these will be listed at the top of a calibration procedure. Uh, things to ensure that you do to help create an accurate environment and accurate vehicle condition to perform the calibration. Generally, what the OE is getting at here, and a lot of times these steps need to be interpreted, what they're trying to do here is position the vehicle in a stance that is just the way it was at the end of the assembly line when the vehicle was new. That's a known good value. So as we go through some of these, all fluids to recommended levels, the gas tank full. I'm gonna pause on this one because when the vehicle is new and it's calibrated statically at the end of the assembly line, the gas tank isn't full. Depending on the vehicle manufacturer, it either, either has one or two gallons of gas in the tank. Well, unfortunately, that's not something that we can easily duplicate in the field. That would entail us completely draining the fuel tank and then adding precisely the OEM level of fuel. But there is something that we can all do that is consistent, and that is fill the fuel tank to the first click. So once we get the gas tank filled to the first click, the software and the camera can compensate for the change in vehicle weight and distribution to put the camera at the proper pitch and yaw in order to perform an accurate calibration. So moving on, adjust the tire pressures to the placard value. This is not the tire pressures that the vehicle owner prefers. This is not the tire pressures that have been modified and programmed into the vehicle 
These are the tire pressures that were on the placard when the vehicle was new. Because again, tire pressures change vehicle ride height. So we're looking for a very precise position for the vehicle to perform an accurate calibration. Of course, the windshield needs to be clean, especially in front of the camera. The dashboard needs to be clear. No pieces of paper, uh, receipts, clipboards, uh, items on the dashboard that might reflect in the windshield and again, confuse the camera and cause a failed calibration. No additional load in the vehicle. You'll notice that the instructions will say having the original toolkit with the spare tire in the trunk, things like that. They're looking for whatever objects came with the car being placed in the vehicle. No extra load in the trunk. If this is a, a van that uh, a contractor uses for work, if you want to calibrate accurately, it needs, it needs to be unloaded. So this is all about getting, again, getting the vehicle at the proper stance. Uh, all the vehicle lights need to be turned off. We don't want to be draining the battery. And it'd be a very good idea at this point to connect either a battery charger with a clean DC signal, you know, minimal uh, AC ripple, uh, a DC power supply or a programming power supply to maintain battery levels during the calibration. Uh, front wheels need to be steering straight ahead. The rear wheels need to be steering straight ahead. Now, let me tell you what these two mean. You read these uh, many times in the OEM procedures, front wheels steering straight ahead. They're talking about the steering angle sensor being at zero degrees while the wheels are pointing straight ahead and the steering angle, the steering wheel is straight. The only way to get those three together is to have a proper wheel alignment. For the vehicles that um, tell us to make sure the rear wheels are steering straight ahead. More than likely not a vehicle that has rear wheel steering. This is about having the thrust angle set to zero degrees or as close to zero as humanly possible. Most OEMs give you a bit of tolerance. Some just say zero degrees. The thrust angle, which is where the vehicle is driving and where the camera is mounted, is the camera's aimed on the vehicle's center line where the vehicle is pointing. If we can get the center line and the thrust angle to be the same, that will ensure that not only our calibrations will be accurate, but the systems will function properly. When the thrust angle and the vehicle center line are different, that's when we can get some strange behavior out of some of our uh, lane entering and lane keeping systems. Now here's, this is just a generic example. This isn't how cameras really work, but I just wanna give you an example of why we're doing uh, what we're doing on the previous slide with following all those vehicle conditioning uh, instructions. Every camera has a field of view. It, the camera is fixed, the lens does not move, the camera's looking straight ahead, straight ahead, but just like we have peripheral vision, forward-facing cameras have a field of view of generally between 20 degrees and 40 degrees. That camera, as it moves up and down, that's called pitch. As the camera moves side to side or rotates side to side, that's called yaw. If the camera rotates on its center axis, that's called roll. So there's different movements that the camera may have, but this all comes down to the camera has a center point, a zero point. This is the center of the camera's field of view. All forward-facing cameras have the ability to adapt to different driving conditions different vehicle load conditions. But when we calibrate, what we're trying to do is what's called a zero point calibration. We are setting up the camera to understand or learn what its zero point is. So it will have maximum adaptability as load is added and taken away from the vehicle. 
as the gas tank runs low, as we get passengers, we put groceries in the trunk, the contractor puts his equipment back in, the ADOS system can compensate for that, but it needs to know what its zero point is. If we calibrate with a fully loaded vehicle, what we're doing is we're changing the way we teach the cameras zero point. So for instance, in our example, we have a vehicle and um, it told us that the gas tank needed to be full, but the gas tank was at an eighth of a tank. And we said, oh, I'm not gonna get paid for putting gas in the tank and that doesn't really matter. We're just gonna go ahead and calibrate. So we set up this vehicle, we set up our target at the proper height and distance from the vehicle. It's where the camera is expecting to see it. However, this particular vehicle is missing, let's say 17 and a half gallons of gas in the tank. That's a significant amount of weight. That means the back end, back end of the vehicle might be pitched up a bit, which would cause the camera to be pitched down a bit. So now the camera is looking low. The target is set where it's supposed to be, but the camera's center point, its center of its field of view, is now aiming low on the target. So what we're going to do during this calibration is we are going to teach the camera that this is its zero point, that looking down is normal. Again, this is not how cameras really work. This is a very genericized example just to, just to make a point. So let's take this vehicle that we just calibrated. So here's our car with our target set up at two meters and the camera is looking at the center of the target. Now, the problem is we didn't fill the gas tank. So now the back end of the vehicle is pitched up and the camera's looking low. So the camera's looking down just a bit, maybe at two meters, one degree of deviation or, or uh, pitch in the camera is only 1.3 inches. 1.3 inches isn't a big deal, right? But this is only two meters. This isn't the conditions under which the vehicle will be driven when we return it to the consumer. So if we extrapolate this out over 100 meters, like when we're out on the road, so the camera is looking far down the road, expecting to see additional vehicles. However, our vehicle was calibrated with no gas in the tank, and we had that one degree of pitch deviation. So our camera's looking low. Our camera's actually looking into the ground. That one degree of deviation is a 66 inch change at 100 meters. That little bit makes a big difference when looking far down the road. And this applies to both forward-facing cameras and forward radar sensors as well. So if we look at the way our camera is seeing information, the camera is looking at the ground at 65 meters. Now, in this instance, would lane departure warning still function? Yep, it'll probably work just fine. So as we calibrate the forward-facing camera and we take a vehicle out for a test drive and we test our lane departure warning, we may say, hey, I didn't fill the gas tank and I never had a problem. Well, maybe you never had a problem with the lane departure warning system, but remember we talked earlier in the presentation about sensor fusion? This camera on this vehicle works together with the forward-facing radar for automatic emergency braking and forward collision warning. So if the camera can't see a vehicle and the radar can, we're going to have contradictory information and the system may not function properly. In fact, there's a very interesting paper that you could download from IIHS, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. It's uh, their advisory 43 paper, and it talks about how one degree, actually 0.6 degrees of variation in camera mounting affects automatic emergency braking. It cuts its reaction time in half. It's the difference between an automatic emergency braking system that can safely stop a vehicle 
before hitting the car in front of you and a system that hits the vehicle in front of you every single time. So as we as technicians take these vehicles out and we test drive them, what are we test driving? If we're only test driving lane departure warning, we are only doing part of the job. How do you test automatic emergency braking or forward collision warning? Think about that for a second. There are specialized pieces of equipment that you could buy and put out in the parking lot. They're radar reflective targets, but they're kind of costly. It's not something that every shop is just going to go out and buy. Maybe they should, but think about that. You're going to take the vehicle out and drive in traffic and just drive into another vehicle and hope your car stops in time. Well, this is what happens when we say hey, it's close enough and we never had a problem before and then you return a vehicle to a consumer they may get into an accident because we didn't perform the preconditioning instructions properly these systems are all working together today it's not individual systems and components anymore we have to take the bigger picture into account as we move forward with calibration and this example here is talking about pitch this also applies to yaw. What if we change a windshield and we didn't unplug the camera? And I heard this for one glass installer. The camera was calibrated before I changed the windshield. I didn't unplug it. It'll be calibrated after I change the windshield. Well, if you didn't put the windshield exactly in the same position as the OE, that camera position may have shifted a bit. If the camera bracket isn't mounted exactly in the same position as the OE windshield, that camera position shifted a little bit. And if the yaw changes by one degree, again, that's 66 inches at 100 meters, that's the difference between seeing a vehicle in your lane or your vehicle looking at cars in the adjoining lane. And when this type of misalignment occurs, especially when we're looking at radar calibrations, this is when we start getting vehicles that are slamming on the brakes for no known reason, because the radar sensor wasn't properly adjusted and calibrated under the proper preconditions. So keep that in mind. This is very, very important that we follow all these steps accurately. So this list here of when is a calibration necessary is by no means complete. But camera calibrations, of course, Anytime a windshield is repaired or replaced, camera needs to be calibrated. In fact, if you just remove the camera from, the, from its bracket and snap it right back in, according to almost every OEM, that camera needs to be recalibrated because there's no way you can guarantee that that camera goes back in exactly the right position. If on many vehicles, you perform a wheel alignment, anything that changes the thrust angle, or if you relearn the steering angle sensor, you may need to perform forward-facing calibrations of camera and radar. So look at your service information. However, don't just look at the calibration procedures. They may not be listed there. I'll give you an example. In 2017 for a Toyota Camry, Toyota very clearly stated that if you performed a wheel alignment, you need to calibrate the forward-facing camera. In 2019, they dropped that recommendation. However, in the wheel alignment procedure, at the end it says you may need to calibrate the forward-facing camera, but that's not listed in the camera calibration. So you can't just look in one place in service information. You'll need to look at technical service bulletins. You'll need to look at system description and operation maybe system troubleshooting. You'll need to look at the uh, calibration procedures, the alignment procedures, and repair procedures. What about changing a um, air conditioning condenser on a lot of vehicles that requires removing the uh, front bumper cover in the grill assembly? That impacts the forward-facing radar. So you'll have to look at a variety of different uh, procedures to determine what calibrations may need to be performed afterwards. Changes in ride height or tire size. Some vehicle manufacturers allow for a variance in ride height, and during the calibration, they actually ask you 
to measure right height at all four corners, enter, enter those new values, and it will tell you if it's within the acceptable limits. So some vehicles will allow for calibration after a lift kit is installed, for instance. We were working on a 2020 Ford Ranger just the other day, and this vehicle in the Ford IDS software allowed us to input vehicle height change of 12 inches, and it still allowed us to calibrate. That's the OEM scan tool. Aftermarket scan tool would allow us to do that as well. I'm just saying the OEMs are starting to allow us to change ride height and still calibrate these vehicles. Of course, if there's DTCs present, we may need to calibrate. Radar calibrations, uh, very much the same if you remove or change the position of a radar sensor, even after a minor collision. Subaru states, no matter how minor the collision, if you just got bumped a little bit in the parking lot, they want the systems recalibrated, even the forward-facing camera. And Subaru's camera is mounted to the roof of the vehicle. So read your instructions. After any collision repairs, you never know what might have got tweaked just a little bit. Uh, bumper cover removed and replaced, grills removed and replaced, like we talked about air conditioning service. After a wheel alignment, we may have to uh, calibrate that ra uh, forward radar as well. So now let's talk about the different types of calibration. First, we have dynamic calibrations. Dynamic calibrations is where you're, where you're gonna take your scan tool, you're going to initiate the calibration or put the vehicle into calibration mode, and then you're gonna take the vehicle out and drive it under very specific driving conditions. These conditions change with different vehicle manufacturers, but you'll always uh, you'll generally see things like good weather conditions, visible lane markings, uh, objects on the side of the road, guardrails, mailboxes, garbage cans, pedestrians, things like that. The camera is going to be looking for those. Other vehicles on the road, uh, generally speeds above 32 miles an hour, but maybe below 67 miles an hour. The specific instructions for the vehicle you're calibrating will give you those details, minimal lane changes, uh, straight roads, minimal hills. Some vehicles will say, uh, make sure you have uh, 10 car lengths uh, between your vehicle and the vehicle in front. Again, they change from car to car. Uh, we had a chance to do a dynamic calibration on a, that 2020 Ranger the other day, and it allowed us to calibrate. It calibrated successfully with no lane markings on the road. So these cameras and the software are getting much more sophisticated by being able to detect the edges of the road and use that for a dynamic calibration. Just pay attention to what the OEM uh, procedures say for the vehicle you're calibrating. This is not generic information that you use on every vehicle. Next, we have static calibrations. These are the calibrations that you're gonna do in your bay with a calibration frame and targets and different radar calibration fixtures. Again, with a controlled environment, bright lighting, flat level floor, uh, no windows, sometimes a windless environment. That's usually uh, in the OEM procedures because of the, let me say, instability of their OEM calibration systems. They blow over easily. Uh, of course, again, you're going to need your targets and patterns, fixtures, and specifications. There are some vehicles that are static and dynamic, so keep that in mind. So after you perform a static, Hondas will very specifically say, now you have to perform a dynamic calibration. Um, some Hyundai and Kias are very specific about the dynamic. Sometimes a Hyundai Kia or a Subaru might say, uh, take the vehicle out and test drive it under these conditions. That's actually part of the calibration process. Not talking about the test drive. I'm talking about it's an extension of the static calibration. It is a dynamic calibration. The vehicle needs to be test driven after that portion of the calibration is successful. And when it comes to charging for your time, static and dynamic calibrations are generally separate. And a pre-scan and a post-scan are generally separate processes as well. So when we look at calibration types of the vehicles that are on the road today between, between 2009 and 2020 model year, 
56% of calibrations are static calibrations. 37% are dynamic. There are 5% that are static and dynamic. And there's actually 2% that give you a choice between static or dynamic. Now, let me tell you something about where the industry is moving. I know there's been a lot of talk and uh, people uh, predicting that dynamic calibrations are the way it's going to go. And uh, vehicles are going to become self-calibrating. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not the case. According to the OEs, they are going to start either moving away from dynamic towards static or starting to offer static or dynamic calibrations because dynamic calibrations can be very difficult to perform in busy metropolitan areas. With heavy traffic, um, you may never be able to get up to the vehicle speed necessary to perform that calibration. You'll never have the clear distance in front of your vehicle necessary. Um, as, as well as uh, in the northern states in the winter months, November through March, there may be ice and snow on the ground. If the lane markings aren't visible, then the camera can't calibrate. Also, most vehicle manufacturers don't allow you to perform these calibrations at night. So they have to be done during the day. So you're gonna see this change happen very soon. In the 2020 model year, Fiat Chrysler already has vehicles that are static or dynamic for camera and forward radar calibration. They just haven't been turned on in the OE software, OE scan tool software yet. Think about this. Nearly every vehicle make is calibrated at the end of the assembly line statically. General Motors does theirs dynamically, but every other vehicle make, they're calibrated statically. However, we get the vehicle and let's say it's a Ford or it's a BMW or a Volvo and they have a dynamic calibration for the forward facing camera. That camera module has the ability to perform a static calibration. It's just not turned on in the OEM scan tool software yet. So the capability is there once Fiat Chrysler, for instance, gets all their details ironed out and their procedures and their tooling all set up, you're gonna see that 2020 model year vehicles will have static calibration available for camera and radar. And then moving forward, we're gonna see more vehicle manufacturers doing that as well. So, myths and misconceptions. This is the, this is the start of our Q&A section really. And um, these are some of the real common questions and statements that I've heard over the past couple of years regarding ADOS and ADOS calibrations. So it starts with a shop owner saying to me, if I outsource my shop's calibrations, I won't be liable. So I, I don't wanna perform calibrations in my shop. I wanna have the mobile tech do it, or I wanna send the calibrations to the dealership to get done. That way, if something goes wrong, it'll be their fault. Well, unfortunately, according to attorneys, this is not my opinion, there are attorneys actually that now specialize in uh, not just vehicular cases, but uh, ADOS lit litigation. There's a very famous law firm in Texas that specializes in ADOS litigation, believe it or not. Um, in conversations with them, they told me the liability when performing ADOS calibrations lies with whoever charged the consumer for the calibration or whoever charged the insurance company. So if a repair shop has a third party perform the calibrations and the shop is paying that third party and then billing it through, that shop is liable. I am not saying that the dealership or the, the mobile tech is not liable. I'm just saying that the shop is not protected by strictly using a third party to perform calibrations. If I don't use OE equipment to perform ADOS calibr calibrations, I will be liable. I know there's a lot of people that were waiting for this question and um, yes, this one is false. Again, the calibration is not performed by the scan tool. It doesn't matter if your scan tool is OE or aftermarket, 
if it has the capability of performing the calibration and you have the proper target of the proper size set at the right distance and at the right height, and if there's multiple targets set at the right distance apart, and you followed all the vehicle preconditioning instructions to a T, you are no more or less liable for using aftermarket equipment than OE. I have seen so many photographs in the user groups, especially Facebook groups, from OE only guys performing calibrations outside, in a driveway, on a street that's crowned, in a parking lot, um, where you know that these are not flat and level surfaces and they're not supposed to be doing them outside in the first place. What I'm getting at is just because you use OE equipment doesn't mean you're doing it right. Just because you use aftermarket equipment doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. You can be just as right with aftermarket as you are with OE if you follow all the steps in the instructions and measure and place targets properly. If there's no DTCs present, the car doesn't need a calibration. Well, unfortunately today, that is not the case. Today, most of the vehicles on the road will only set a DTC if there is a hardware malfunction, a wiring connection malfunction, a network or communication error. Um, if you unplug a camera, if you start to calibrate and then stop for some reason, you back out with the scan tool, you may have wiped the camera's memory and it would set a DTC for requiring calibration. But there are very few systems on the road today that will set a DTC because the camera feels it's not calibrated properly. Now we are gonna start seeing this very soon. There are some 2020 and 2021 models that have the ability to detect the camera's position and tilt and yaw and pitch and how it perceives reality and set DTCs for poor calibration. But today, for most of the vehicles we're working with, we will not set DTCs for no uh, no calibration. Next, if I unplug the camera or radar sensor, if I don't unplug the camera or radar sensor, I don't need to calibrate. Again, sorry. If you change the position, took it out of its bracket and remounted it, according to all the OEMs, it still needs to be calibrated. It's not about unplugging and plugging it back in. It's about changing the position and making sure after the repair, the system is calibrated to operate accurately. Here's one. Aftermarket ADAS calibration procedures are not always the same as OE. This one is true or could be true. However, here's why you may see differences between measurements in an aftermarket system versus the measurements you would find in your shop information system or in your OE service information. The OE service information measures from a fixed point on the vehicle to the target. Many aftermarket systems are measuring from the same fixed point on the vehicle to a fixed point on the calibration frame. Since the aftermarket manufacturer knows the exact distance from that fixed point to the target, they can compensate for that measurement in software. So the target ends up in exactly the same position, even though the measurements may differ. And here's an analogy I like to use. Think of the uh, map software on your phone. You enter in a, an address. You're going to a restaurant to eat tonight. Well, Two months from now, you're going to a restaurant to eat. You enter an address into your phone and it gives you three different routes on how to get to the same place. No matter which route you choose, you're going to get to the exact same location. Same thing here. We just found an easier way to get that target placed that requires fewer steps and slightly different measurements. But that's OE size target ends up in the OE position and the OE height at the OE distance every time. So at this point, we're gonna start our first Q&A section. Pete, you got any questions for me? Well, I'd like to go ahead and first thank you for taking the time to put such a very thorough presentation together for everyone who's watching. 
I know I learned a lot just by watching what you had to say. I'm sure many of those who are with us today did the same. But it also left open some questions. I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there uh, who are looking at this going like, oh my gosh, I don't want to get involved with all that. That's like way too complicated for me. You know, and I understand that feeling first. If you're in the collision side of the business, you kind of have to be involved with this as you put these cars back together again. So if you're not doing it in-house, you need to make friends with someone in your community or your area of business that does have this skill and have this equipment to be able to perform these calibrations. This is not a maybe, this is a must do before you return that vehicle to the customer. I really want to reach out though to also all the mechanical repair shops. You know, you may decide that you're not going to diagnose issues with any of these systems. You're not going to replace radar assemblies. You're not going to do any of the glass repair. But you have to understand some of the things that George pointed out. Even routine service repairs that you're doing in your shop are going to require you to perform these calibrations. For example, uh, doing some research on another project on a hybrid Toyota for a uh, uh, AC repair to access the compressor or you have to remove the front grill and the front radar assembly. As George pointed out, even if I don't unplug that unit, there's no way I can be assured that that radar unit right back, went right back to where it's supposed to be. So uh, other minor things, changing the alignment. If you change the thrust angle, then you change the whole pitch and yaw of the, of the camera's view, and that's a call for calibration. So there's so many different things that you do in your shop every day that's affecting these systems. You need to be aware of that, and you can't stick your head in the ground. You've got to realize that you've got to send that car back out to your customer working the same way it did when it arrived. So with that being said, uh, let's see what we have some questions here. Uh, the first one refers back to something that you mentioned earlier, George. And that is, do you recall what model year or what time of frame did sensor fusion start? Uh, the, the person that is asking uh, says I'm sure it depends on manufacturer, but a lot of these systems started implementing strategies around the same time. Can you give us some clarity on that or some insight into that? I'm thinking back on uh, documentation that I've read. The earliest that I could recall is 2014, but uh, I will do some additional research and see if I can find it on uh, any earlier vehicles. Okay, and I want to do point out too that at the end of our um, webcast today, we are going to put up some information that allow you to reach out for support for any questions that we don't get to. And unfortunately, based on time restraints, there are going to be some that we don't. Uh, so here's a question from Mark. After wheel alignment, which calibrations are required to be performed. Okay, so first I wanna to touch on the word required, because some OEMs require, some OEMs recommend, some OEMs assume. So which calibrations should be performed? If the wheel alignment changes the thrust angle, or if you're re-setting uh, the zero angle sensor, the steering angle sensor, uh, the forward-facing camera and the forward-facing radar, it's a good idea to calibrate those two. But again, that word required is a little touchy when you uh, look at the different OEMs and how they word things. Best right. practice, forward camera and forward radar. Okay, and certainly if you do anything that's going to uh, alter the thrust or you see that the thrust line has been or comes into your shop and it's not on zero, and it's correctable to that, you want to do that, right, and then perform these same calibrations? Correct. Okay. So, again, keep in mind, again, fellas, the easiest way that I have of trying to keep track of all this stuff for the cameras and radars is, again, that's the eyes of the car. So if they're not looking where they're supposed to be looking and they don't have a clear field of vision, then they can't do their jobs. Um, all right, let's see if we can handle the next question. Being that different manufacturers require different calibrations and corresponding equipment, do you forecast ADOS and ADOS calibration becoming standardized throughout manufacturers? Now, I think you kind of addressed that to a point earlier when you were talking about your, your own Q&A. Uh, so this is from Crystal. Crystal, I'm going to give a shot to that. As, as George pointed out, you might see a move to more static calibrations only because some of the challenges in the urban areas of dealing with a, a uh, dynamic calibration or the choice, as George said earlier, about being able to do both. 
So I don't know that you're going to see that they're all going to be done exactly the same with exactly the same targets and distances and so forth, but um, I think you'll see a move towards the static uh, more so. Uh, next question you also answered earlier, George, so we'll recap that for our viewers. Uh, can it be done outside on a flat level concrete pad? I think you put a big no on that, right? We don't want to do that out in the bright sunlight. Uh, yeah, definitely not a forward camera calibration. That could, you know, interfere. But you could also get one of those uh, pop-up party tents that you could cover the front of the vehicle and your target with uh, to, you know, shield it from the sun as long as you don't... Um, have any clutter in the background. Flat and level is the key. Okay, and then the last one I'm going to be able to get in here for our Q&A and the midpoint of our presentation is, can you use sandbags to simulate a full gas tank? That's actually a great question. That This, this one comes up real often when I teach the, uh, the class live. Um, okay, so from a I'm trying to think how to, how, how to phrase this, uh, Peter, because I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So from a liability perspective, you should always fill the gas tank, okay? However, I have heard of a lot of shops adding weight to the back of the vehicle to compensate for the missing fuel. Um, I will say getting as close as you can is way better than having an empty tank, but it's not necessarily the right thing. Um, you'll also see that there are some vehicle manufacturers that are actually looking at the gas gauge to see how close to full. And if it's less than 80% full, it won't allow you to perform the calibration. So it depends, again, for weight. Yes, you could do that. But, um, you know, the easiest thing is to have the customer fill up the gas tank before they bring the vehicle to your shop to make sure that you're doing it right. Yeah, absolutely. And then if you do and you're explaining to your customer that that's a part of the, the procedure, then that's a billable service that you can, you know, bill to your customer like any other fluids in the shop. So, yeah, I would just stick with, like you said, go ahead and just fill the gas tank up. All right, so we've checked. I, I know you have some more questions. I apologize we can't get to them all. But again, at the end of the webcast, I will put up some information to where you can forward those questions and uh, they'll be glad to answer them for you. Of course, you can always send them to me. If I don't have the answers, I will get them for you and pass those along as well. Uh, but I think you can have a lot more fun watching a first timer like me do something that I'm yet used to doing, and that's actually performing a static calibration. Got a 2020 Toyota here that we're gonna do the uh, forward camera calibration on. Never fooled with this equipment before, never tried this procedure before, so it's gonna be a learning experience for all of us. Before we dive into the actual procedure though, I have a short little video I'd like to share that shows you the basic setup procedures necessary to align the frame to the vehicle, a necessary part before we do any type of calibration on any vehicle. So let's go ahead and roll that video. We are going to review the Autel ADIS calibration tool package and demonstrate the tool set placement for the calibration of radar and cameras used by such advanced driver assistance systems as adaptive cruise control, lane departure warning, blind spot detection, and night vision system. The calibration frame standard package comes with the adjustable frame, two wheel clamps with laser levels for precise calibration, and the Volkswagen and Mercedes-Benz pattern targets for lane departure warning calibration. The complete set of vehicle manufacturer's pattern targets for lane departure warning calibration is sold as a separate package for glass repair shops. The radar and night vision calibration tools and rear and surround view camera patterns are also sold separately, allowing the shops to order the tools based on their repair requirements. Set up and perform the calibration frame leveling procedure by following these steps. Park the vehicle on a flat and level surface with its front wheels pointing straight and ensure there are no objects in front of the vehicle. The vehicle's coolants and engine oil should be at recommended levels and the gas tank full. The vehicle should not be carrying any load, passengers or cargo. Attach the VCI to the vehicle and connect the diagnostic tool to the vehicle. If connected through cable, please pass cable through window. Close the doors. Adjust the tire pressure to the recommended value. 
These vehicle preparation measures vary by vehicle and system. Please follow the preparation instructions on the Maxisys ATIS tablet to ensure accurate calibration. Step 1. Position the calibration frame. Place the calibration frame in front of the vehicle. No pattern should be attached to the frame. Rotate the knob at the back of the crossbar to align the two red marked lines. Rotate the top knob to move the ruler to the middle. Slide the crossbar sliding plate to the middle of the crossbar. Use the handle or depress buttons to set the crossbar level with the center of the front wheels. Power on the sliding plate laser and aim the laser at the middle front of the vehicle. Move the frame to the specified distance away from the vehicle. The correct distance of the frame from the vehicle may differ by vehicle manufacturer. Consult the help section on the tablet for the correct distance for that vehicle. Ensure both sides of the crossbar are at the same distance away from the center of the front wheels. Prior to powering off laser, ensure it continues to be focused at the middle front of the vehicle. Secure the frame to the floor by turning the four hand knobs to lower the feet. Step 2. Connect wheel clamps and lasers. Attach the wheel clamps to each of the rear wheels and continue to turn the knob clockwise until the clamps are tightly secured. Connect the laser to the wheel clamp with the laser board facing forward. Turn on the laser and aim it at the crossbar ruler. Rotate the knob on the top of the crossbar until both rulers have the same value lit by the laser. Step 3. Adjust crossbar parallel to the vehicle. Pull up the cover plates on each side of the crossbar. Adjust the laser to focus it at the crossbar reflector and aim the reflected beam at the laser board. Turn the knob at the back of the crossbar until both laser boards have the same value lit by the reflected beam. Now the calibration frame is parallel to the vehicle. Once the setup process is finished, initiate the calibration procedure and follow the instructions on the Maxisys ATIS tablet. Attach the target panels to the frame accordingly for camera calibration, radar calibration, or night vision calibration. Please contact Autel Technical Support with any questions or visit our website, autel.com, for additional support or product information. Again, fellas, I don't think that I can stress enough how important it is to make sure that your targeting system is set up properly in relation to the vehicle. If you want to think of it this way, all the ADOS systems use camera and or radar systems as the eyes of the vehicle. And if the vehicle can't see properly, then those systems can't function properly. So take the extra time, make sure that that target system is set up to the center line and parallel to the vehicle, just like the video that we just took a look at showed. Now, to save a little bit of time, I've already had and set uh, the system up here for the demonstration we like to do for you. And I gotta tell you, I've never done one of these ever before in my life. And I'm sure there's a lot of you out there that feel the same way. Maybe you're a little hesitant to tackle these systems. But looking at the Autel Maxisys system, I was very impressed by the fact that it pretty much leads you by the hand. And if you do have a question, their support is right there to make sure that you get the answers you need to carry off these calibrations successfully. The key is following the instructions and following the procedures step by step. Now in this case, we're gonna try our hand, or I'm gonna try my hand, 
at doing the forward camera calibration on this 2020 Toyota Corolla. Now this is just a, kind of a standout there for the Toyota brand. They said some time ago how they were going to make sure that all of their models were going to have the latest safety equipment and they're meeting that uh, what they said they were going to do. This is a really good example. This is a base model car and it's got all the ADOS belts and whistles on it. So we're going to do a forward camera calibration, or I'm going to do a forward camera calibration on it. I've got my mentor, George Lesniak, in the background, making sure that I don't do anything too awful bad to make sure he's going to stop me in the process. Um, and the first thing to do is to make sure that the vehicle is on and we're connected to our scan tool. And um, make sure that you use a good battery maintainer on the vehicle, especially if you're going to have a procedure that may take a while. So you want to make sure, just like any other kind of programming, that you have that system power supply steady, um, steady voltage, uh, very little AC ripple across it. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I've already got the vehicle hooked up, and we're going to start off by pressing on the ADAS calibrate. There we go. Sometimes those Android touchscreens can give you a little bit of hesitation. So now scanning through the different systems to see what's available on this particular vehicle. And we see they come up top the front recognition camera. That's the one we're interested in. And there we see it listed on the menu. Okay, so far there's no faults on the assist, and that's a good thing. So now we're going to go ahead and press the calibration procedure button. And it's going to ask us why. Why are we going to uh, calibrate the camera? Did we replace the windshield? Well, that's a, that's a common cause uh, for needing to recalibrate. So if you own a collision shop, body shop, a glass shop, You've probably done, as George pointed out in his, in his PowerPoint earlier, thousands of these vehicles uh, that needed this type of calibration, and you may not even have realized it was necessary. It's also imperative that OEM glass, or that glass be equivalent to the OEM standard, I should say, if you put on a cheap brand and it's not going to give the same uh, visual acuity through the glass that the OEM glass does, that's going to throw that camera's vision off. It's just like me wearing somebody else's glasses. So uh, that's one choice. The other is that we repaired or replaced the camera. Maybe we adjusted the position of the camera on the vehicle body. Um, George, could you chime in a bit just on that? What are some of the examples where that could have been adjusted um, on, the, on the vehicle body? Are there things that the shop could do on a daily basis that they don't realize is making that no, happen? Not, not necessarily, but uh, what Toyota specifically is getting at here is if for any reason you remove the camera from its bracket and put it back in the bracket even if you didn't change the windshield the system needs to be recalibrated because you cannot guarantee that the camera was placed back in exactly the original position absolutely and that's a good point again it's the kind of thing that that i wouldn't necessarily think of when i was making that kind of a minor repair especially if that component was just part of an r, &R procedure i was doing on another system uh, for example, in some other research that I was doing for an article that I wrote not too long ago, it was accessing the AC compressor on a Toyota model. And to get to that, you ended up having to remove the, the front radar. But you don't know that you're putting it right back in the exact same position. And as George pointed out earlier, you know, that one degree of difference can make a big difference in how that system functions. So thanks for that, George. That's a good point. And of course, are there any DTC? So let's select replace the windshield. Hit OK. Okay, now it's asking for a calibration method. Do we want to do a one-type calibration, which as you can see from the diagram, uses a set of three targets, or we do want to do a, the B, calibration the sequence, which is using one. I'm going to select the B. And now it's telling me what I need. I need the calibration frame. That's the big unit that you see behind me. I need the target board, and I need the target board holder. Now, here's the target board that's specified for that vehicle. Now here's where we make a point two that's come up earlier. This is not something that you can go into the service information system and print off your inkjet and then put that up on a prop and hope to do the same thing. It's critical that this be a good contrast, um, that it's clearly visible, and then it's proper, uh, properly positioned relative to the vehicle. So you don't cut corners with this. Uh, again, you're going to impact the safety and operation of that system if you don't do it exactly the way it's supposed to. George, you have anything you want to add to that point? No, you, you brought up good points, uh, uh, Peter, like um, 
you mentioned from OEM service information, uh, Toyota does allow technicians to print their own targets, but those targets can be easily damaged, printed at the wrong size, whereas uh, our targets are a hardboard that's uh, very easily cleaned and they're very durable. Yeah, the last thing you would do is make that with the last little bit of black ink you've got left in your printer. <laughs> exactly. All right, uh, so then we have the wheel clamps, lasers, and tape measure. This is all part of setting up the system. We have those in place on the vehicle and, of course, on the frame. So we're going to hit OK. And now it says, OK, please choose a parking spot, uh, either on level ground or a spot where the uh, calibration frame and the vehicle are not at the same level. Now, pretty level here in the studio where we're doing the webinar today, so I'm going to select that option. But I would like George to kind of chime in a little bit on situations where figure B might come into play, where the right height might be different. I'm thinking one position would be like if it's on like an alignment rack or something. What are some instances that you see commonly or that you, that you think of, George? Well, you're exactly right, Peter. It, it was intended for uh, performing calibrations on a, a drive-on uh, lift or an alignment lift. Uh, in this way, by telling the tool that you're performing a calibration on a raised platform, the tool will ask you to measure the height of that platform or the height of your lift and enter that value into the scan tool. Then the scan tool will compensate by providing a higher target setting to ensure that the targets in the vehicle are on exactly the same plane. And uh, let me ask you this too. Now, I know that this has come into question by a lot of shop owners and a lot of instructors have made a big issue that you know you must have a level area to perform these um, uh, calibrations but just that just comes to think if i have enough space around my and you showed the illustration earlier around my alignment rack and i can align i can make the alignment rack level right relative to uh, the surrounding floor does that help me kind of accommodate the, the, these calibrations or, or do I still need to look at some dedicated space for these, these services? Well, it really depends on the type of calibration you're going to perform. If it's a forward facing camera calibration like we're doing here today, it's actually quite easy to do those on, on an alignment lift as long as you have enough free space in front of the vehicle or the vehicle would need to be backed onto the alignment lift. But if you're doing radar calibrations or round view monitoring calibrations, that's a different story. Since the uh, radar sensors uh, might pick up uh, false signals from the alignment uh, machine itself or from uh, the posts on the lift, and the around view monitoring patterns would be too far away from the vehicle since they're down on the ground and the vehicle's raised in the air. So forward-facing camera calibrations on alignment machine are, are pretty simple and straightforward. Yeah, but again, involved in a lot of the other systems, not so much. Correct, not so much. Yeah. There are some yeah. radar calibrations that we can perform, but uh, not all. Right, very good. All right, so let's move on. We're going to pick figure A level ground as our uh, selection here. And this again, just like George was saying, do I have enough room in front of the vehicle? Now, in this case, there should be no black or white pattern objects in front of the vehicle. Of course, we don't have that issue here in the studio. Uh, the calibration should be formed in a windless environment. That's not a problem. <laughs> As we look over, so turn on the AC. Um, ensure the vehicle is not facing any direct light source as this will affect the camera calibration. Now, that's a good point. If you work in a lot of these shops that have bays on either side of the service aisle, I mean, you could be pointing right directly at the bay across from you right to their doors and having direct sunlight coming coming in behind the calibration equipment. And again, as you pointed out in your earlier uh, presentation, you've got to watch what's in the background. You know, you can't have a bunch of toolboxes and tires stacked up behind the equipment. You have to make sure you take that into consideration. And finally, ensure there are no reflective materials. All right, so it's got that set up. It specifies 1.5 meters or 59.1 uh, inches. That's very easy to do. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick demonstration how we would do that on the machine. We're just going to borrow one of the metric tape measures that comes with the equipment. And then all I'm going to do is measure to the back end of the bar and the center of the vehicle and make sure that I come in at 150 millimeters or 1.5 meters, which we do. 
So we, now we know that we're, we're the correct distance and all of that is ready to go. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, uh, one point here. I believe, um, I can see the screen that you're uh, working on in the tool, but I believe the screen you're looking at is actually referencing the free and clear space to perform the calibration and not necessarily the measurements to the calibration frame. Okay, okay. Is it yeah, showing that's, kind of that's a, very uh, good. a gray area in front of the vehicle with yeah. width and depth measurements? Yes, exactly right. So okay. what George yeah. pointed out, this is a potential mistake on my part. Let's make sure we clarify that everybody, everybody can see the scan tool and it's pointing out this is the shaded area. Maybe I should have read first, like, like tell everybody to do. Okay, um, uh, 1.5 meters from the front of the vehicle to the uh, chassis and then three meters to either side is the area we want available in front. So let's go ahead and continue reading the calibration preparations. Keep the front wheels of the vehicle in a straight ahead position. Ensure the engine oil is at the specified level. Coolant is the specified level. Gas tank is full. Spare tank is in the, uh, spare tires in the vehicle. The standard tools are in the vehicle. No, no, there's no person in the vehicle. Uh, turn off the headlights, close all doors. Ensure the vehicle carries no extra load. So we don't want a trunk full of stuff. We don't want a back seat full of stuff. Adjust the tire pressure to the specified value. Clean the windshield. Not gonna do any good if I'm trying to look through a dirty pair of glasses, right? So we wanna make sure the windshield's clean. And then attach the VCI to the vehicle, connect the diagnostic tool. Of course, we're already connected uh, to the vehicle. And that's the points I wanna make out. I mean, obvious to the mistake that I made earlier, and we'll get to that some more in a bit, but we want the vehicle in a specified condition, right? George, it's gotta be the right weight so that it's, it's sitting properly relative to the camera. It's again, it's, it's another one of those critical points, isn't it? Uh, that uh, we want that uh, camera to, to look exactly where it's supposed to, right, relative to the vehicle. Oh, that's uh, absolutely true. We're trying to basically duplicate the conditions that the vehicle was in at the end of the assembly line when it was originally calibrated. And since um, brand new vehicles are, are generally um, have one gallon or two gallons of fuel in the tank, that's not something that we can easily duplicate in the field. So the software engineers at the OEMs have designed the calibration process to allow us to fill the fuel tank, because that is something that we can do consistently, uh, consistently. And this allows us to place the camera at the proper pitch to perform the calibration and get, you know, get the camera set up for a real world operation. Right, and that's what you referenced in your prior uh, exactly. presentation, right? The proper pitch to begin with. All right, and there's even a little helpful video in there. We won't play that for the sake of time and for clarity. And moving on, check the calibration frame to make sure it has been properly placed. If it has been properly placed, click OK to continue. Do not perform uh, the calibration function. The calibration frame is placed properly. Click one cancel second, return. So pressing OK uh, bypasses the setup of the frame. And in setup is where you're going to get your critical measurement for the distance to okay. place the frame. Setup. See, I knew there was a reason I had a mentor on the hook to tell me what I'm doing wrong. Oh, and don't, right. don't beat yourself up, uh, Peter. These are very common uh, errors that are made in the field. Yeah, and, and again, it's stressing. It's like anytime you're doing something the very first time, you should have seen us putting this frame together. And if you're wondering what I'm looking down at, it's my friend George, as he's on my little laptop here, so I can look down and talk to him while you guys are seeing him on the big screen. But again, it's like anything else that you do for the first time, uh, and you're just gonna have the advantage to learn. That's one of the advantages that we have at Motor Age is being able to go out in the field. I don't profess to be the best mechanic ever, ever born, but I know a lot of guys who are very good at what they do, George is one of them, so that's why I'm glad he's in my corner today doing ADOS. So thanks, George, for being here. So Eric, like he said, move the setup, move the calibration frame to the level ground in front of the vehicle. The pattern board or target board holder has been installed. Remove it first. So if the pattern yeah. board or target with, board... With the uh, pattern board holder, uh, you don't need to worry about that because it's easy to see through. Okay. Rotate the fine tuning bolt to line the marked lines in position A. Uh, loosen the handle two on the crossbar and then rotate the fine tuning bolt in position B is in line with the red mark line. So that's centering the crossbar, 
right on on the on the on the frame. Exactly. So w what we're doing in this step is pretty much universal for uh, any calibration utilizing the calibration frame. Right. This is the it's this worth, is the initial we're zeroing out the frame. We're right. This is the initial setup that we did and saw in the video. Right. Exactly. Okay. All right. So next page. Uh, sure, the front wheels are pointed straight ahead. Place the uh, frame directly in front of the center of the vehicle. Adjust the height of the crossbar so that it's roughly level with the center of the front wheel. Turn on the laser and aim it at the front center of the vehicle. Okay, again, these are steps that we've already taken to get it on the center line and to get it parallel. So we're just going to kind of scan through these for a little bit. Hold the handle on the calibration frame. Move the frame distance between the vehicle emblem and the back of the crossbar. And the laser means that to say, hold the handle on the calibration frame and move the frame until the distance between the vehicle emblem and the back of the crossbar is 47.72 inches or 1212 millimeters. And the laser remains in the front center of the vehicle. Then turn off the laser. Okay, so that means that I am a little too close or actually too far away. Right. From where I was, because I set it up to 59 and some change in inches, uh, whatever the millimeters happened to be at the time. So I'm a little far off. Rotate all the bolts on the base and they slightly touch the ground. And then note, do not move the crossbar. All right. So um, let's go ahead and do that. Go ahead and hold the handle on the calibration frame, move the frame to the uh, back of the crossbar is 1212 millimeters. And while I'm doing this, I'm also keeping that laser near the center. All right, so I got my distance set there properly now. That, uh, if you recall, that was a mistake that George pointed out earlier. So we got that taken care of. Now we're just going to go ahead and Secure the feet real quick. Just bring them in contact with the floor. This is just so it doesn't go rolling around on you and uh, change the position of the frame as we're continuing. We'll go ahead and place our tape measure back in its holder. And one last thing we have to do, uh, and this nice feature about the machine, you can either hook this up so it's an electric power motor that raises this unit up or down, or you can use the hand crank like I have. And what we're going to do here, since I don't need to uh, realign the center line anymore, if you recall early on, they wanted us to have this down at the level of the tires. So I'm going to try to get that pretty close because we still have a few checks to make if we're going to recheck at all. You know, again, I made the mistake of having it too far away. I don't want to make sure that in the process I didn't change anything else. And we will see if that's close enough. We'll start with that. So that leaves us on our next step ready for us to hit the next button on our page. All right. Now here we're setting up the uh, rear um, targets. Um, probably can't see them in the shot. We'll put a few stills in so you can see what we're talking about. These are just kind of like uh, alignment targets, uh, but specifically designed to help you get this, the arm now parallel to both sides of the vehicle. So it says choose a centering setup. We're either using the Autel kit or a compatibly equipped alignment machine. Well, I'm going to use the ADOS kit. So. That's uh, Autel kit, that's A. 
Check the wheel clamp and ensure its pawls are equal in length. Well, we've done that. Attach the two wheel clamps to the rear wheels. And rotate the bolt clockwise until the pawls are tightly secured. Again, just put it, like putting on an alignment head. That's correct. Fully insert the connecting shaft of the laser into the clamp port and ensure the laser calibration board faces the vehicle's driving direction. Next page. Turn on the lasers attached to the rear wheels and adjust them to the laser so the laser will hit the rulers on both sides of the cross bear, uh, car cover plate. That's the two red targets that you see at the base of the unit. And both are hitting the board. I don't know if you can get a good angle on that, but this is actually reading in about uh, one, not quite 140. And on the other side, I know you can't see it, but it's actually reading in about 155 on the ruler. So let's see what our next step is. Loosen the handle and rotate the tuning bolt until the rulers on both sides have the same value. Then tighten the handles to secure the crossbar. So what we have to do is we're going to move that crossbar left and right until the values are equal. So I got the one about 147 on that side, about 147 on that side, and we will lock that in. So far, so good. It's just following the directions on the scan tool now that I've been instructed by my mentor to take the time to actually read the proper pages. So on to the next page. So unfold the cover blades on both sides of the crossbar, adjust the lasers attached to the rear wheels so that the lasers can shine anywhere on the uh, crossbar reflectors. Now we're going back to the rear. Uh, adjust the lasers attached to the rear wheels to control the up-down movement of the lasers. And then finally, the reflected laser must be located at the scale board of the laser coordinate board. So in other words, we're going to open this up, and there'll be a mirror there that's now going to reflect that laser back to the back. And now we're going to adjust the height so we can see it on the board. Pete, are you adjusting the height of the crossbar? Yes, I'm bringing it up so I can see it on the board. Actually, that's not going to change anything because the, um, the angle's not really changing. Uh, so what okay. you need to do is change the rotation of the lasers mounted on the wheel clamps. Very good, so we'll just leave that where it is. So we're gonna adjust the back side there, which again, I apologize if you can't quite see it. All right, so now we got that set up. See what the next step is. Adjust the lasers, uh, next page. We missed something. So the laser can shine anywhere in the crossbar reflectors. Finally, the reflected laser must be located at the scale board laser coordinate board. You might need to scroll down. Ah, yes, it does. Rotate the fine tuning bolt to control left right movement. Uh, following the above adjustment, the scale values lit on both sides must be the same. So it's kind of just like just like we just did on the big red bars. Right, George, uh, yeah. to make sure that the values are the same. So, all right, I think we can do that. So the first step that you did was to center the frame to the vehicle's uh, thrust angle. And now what you're doing is squaring the frame or making it parallel to the rear axle. All right, got that set. and then fold the cover plates on both ends of the crossbar so we can close that up. Next page. So the calibration frame has been properly placed. Turn off the lasers attached to the wheel clamps. 
Click exit to return the calibration preparation screen and click OK to start the function. All right, so we make sure we got the lasers off. Okay. So, guys, I mean, um, for the first time, it wasn't too bad. Made a couple of mistakes. Luckily, I had someone who knows what they're doing to follow along with me and point those out to me. But I think if I were doing this more than once, I'd get the process down pretty quick, right, George? What would normally this process take for someone who's done it a couple of times? Well, stepping back a bit, uh, generally, someone who uh, uses this for the first time might take them between 30 and 40 minutes to perform this calibration on this uh, 2020 Corolla. But uh, after you've gotten used to it, it's pretty easy to get this knocked out in 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah, excellent. And and kind of on the side note, um, what kind of a uh, what kind of a labor bill? What kind of value is this for the business that's actually performing the calibration? It depends on how you bill. If you go by uh, book time, uh, I think Toyota pays 1.2 hours for this, oh. but um, that doesn't really take into account the cost of uh, the scan tool or the calibration equipment. Sure. So I know most shops are charging more of a flat rate for uh, uh, calibration, and I've seen anywhere from 250 to you know over 350 or 400 dollars uh, for a single cal. Uh, okay. Now I know there's one thing we haven't done yet. Obviously, we have to do something with that target height. So let's see if that's still in the preparation procedures. And this, I think, is where we left off. We talked about the the need to have the vehicle pretty much the way it rolled off the showroom floor. Uh, so that the pitch of the camera is where it's supposed to be in order for the process and for the uh, calibration to occur correctly. I don't have to hit set up again, right? I can just move on to OK. Exactly right. When, when you hit the OK button just a second ago or you hit the escape button, it brought you back to the starting page for the vehicle preparation instructions. Gotcha. Now you hit OK and it'll move forward into the calibration process. So again, it's something that new. I haven't had the opportunity to really uh, use the Autel tool. I'm not familiar with its menu and its functions. It's something that, again, you just get acclimated to, you know, anytime you have a new tool in the shop. So that's easy exactly to get over right. overcome. So we uh, make sure it's been properly placed. If it's been properly placed, click OK to continue. Uh, do not perform the function until the flame is, uh, frame is placed properly. Again, can't stress that enough, George, right? I mean, it's so critical to make sure that when we place that target, it's exactly where it needs to be. You're right. The majority of the time that it takes to perform a forward-facing cal camera calibration, or actually any cal calibration, is in the precision of the setup. The calibration itself is very, very fast. It's all about placing the targets properly so the calibration will be accurate. All right. So let's go ahead and see where we can go from here. So now it says, do not attach the target bolt hold board holder before the sliding plate bolt on the holder crossbars tighten, attach the target bolt holder to the crossbar and tighten the bolts to secure the holder. Uh, attach the target board to the sliding plate. Uh, make sure it's fully attached. Calibration should be formed. We know about the background. We want to make sure that's okay. Uh, rotate all the bolts of the base of the calibration frame to reference the bubble level. So I understand that. Now we're, we, we took and set those screws just to kind of keep it from rolling around. But now we're going to look at there's two bubble levels on the back of the upper bar. So we're going to make sure that that bar is uh, plumb and level both directions Correct. using those adjustments, right? So That's I'm going exactly to go, right. go ahead. Oh, so that, that you're exactly right. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I have my target that we need to use. We'll bring this up. I kind of wish I hooked up the electric motor now, George. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of cranking in there. Not a problem. Did you remember to drop that ruler down to the ground, Pete? What's that? I said, did you remember to drop that ruler down to the ground? No, I haven't, because I don't think we've seen the spec yet, right? Oh, so, I'm sorry. I thought so. that's what you yeah. said you were doing. My fault. What, uh, what George referred to, ladies and gents, um, is that obviously if we're going to do the camera, uh, we have to have the camera, the target at the right height relative to the camera. And there's a very convenient measuring system on the back of this platform. allows you to do that very quickly, very accurately. 
right now I'm just going to kind of get in the ballpark. All right. And it may be too high. Now, if you'll remember, if you saw earlier, we chose the three uh, 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 multiple step um, targeting. We could either put three targets up at once, or we probably have to do one three times, I'm thinking. And that's the one I selected. So the first one we're going to do is get the one here in the center. And on the back side is the center mark to line up. So I'm going to go ahead and do that next. That's secured. And then the target itself is positively located against hardboard target, not flimsy paper, and is positively located using dowels. So we'll make sure that that's in place. Come on. There we go. And just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere, nice strong magnet to keep it there. We're also going to put this safety wire on so that doesn't go anywhere. So there's our target. We still have to have the height. Oh, got to do the level. Make sure that's correct. Don't want George to get mad at me. We're missing something. Let's bring that down where I can see it better. And the levels are good, so I'm going to leave that alone. I'm not going to mess with that. So the last thing we need to know is exactly where to put that. Hit OK. So OK, loosen the bolt on the top of the ruler so the ruler touches the ground. That's what we were talking about earlier, located on the back. Adjust the height of the crossbar. That's where I just mounted the target. At 1,350 millimeters on the B side of the ruler and then push the ruler back to the original position. So again, you can't see this from your location. I apologize for that. But there's a ruler, releases here, and it has two sides to it. And I'm gonna bring this down to the B side, which is the right side of the ruler at 1,350 millimeters. And I think that's probably why George was asking me about it earlier, because that's way down here. And he knew that. He just wanted to see if I could still crank. All right. And there we go. Now we got that at 1,350 millimeters. We should be in pretty good shape, huh, George? Yeah, exactly. All right. Let's see, uh, let's see what, the machine, what it tells us here next. Now, one second, Pete. At this point, well, we're not quite to the point of um, calibrating. The next screen is going to show you some values coming from the uh, from the camera. But when we actually get to the point of calibrating, you're going to want to make sure that you're standing behind the side view mirrors so you're not in view of the camera. Oh, that's a good point. Because I because then we talked about having obstructions in front of the camera or in the background didn't even realize that you could be one of them. Right. So that's a, that's a great point. Okay, I'm, I think I'm in pretty good shape here. I'm about even with the driver's door. Is that okay? Yeah, you'll be fine. I can't okay. see you, but I'm sure you're fine. All right, confirm the following conditions. Engine's not running, ignition's on. Okay, now you said the values are from the existing camera, so do I need to note no, these? The, or? The, value, the values are from Toyota. Okay. So those are the values that need to be written to the camera based on the way the vehicle currently sits. So these are the, the OEM values. So okay. this vehicle hasn't been modified, it hasn't been raised or lowered or anything like that. So these values, when you hit OK, are going to be written to the camera module. So the camera will know exactly where it is sitting as far as height and pitch and everything and distance from the target to improve the accuracy of the calibration. All right, so we're all set to hit OK, huh? Correct. Okay, so we hit OK. Establishing communications, preparation adjustments complete, confirm it, then press OK to adjust. Yep. And... And it shows you the values again, correct? Yeah, it shows me the values again. All right, so That's now it? what it's doing this time is it's actually reading the values from the camera. This is for you to validate that those values were actually properly written to the camera so you can go to the next step, which will be the actual calibration process. Okay, so yeah, they all look like the same ones that were in the table. Right. 
Okay, slide target board to the middle of the board holder crossbar and aim the pointer at the marked line. We, we've done that. Okay, now it says slide the target board to the left and aim the and make sure, pointer make sure at 550 left. millimeters on the crossbar. So on the back side of the crossbar is um, another ruler of sorts. He has another ruler. So we're just going to take that target holder there, place that at 550 millimeters as directed, take the safety clamp off and move our target here. Put our safety clamp on. Get out of the way. Hit next. And now it's once to the right, it also at 550 millimeters. So you can just slide the target over to the right at 550. You don't have to take it off. Oh, the whole thing, right? Exactly. Yeah, I guess I could. Something about my sense of balance, George, about having two target withholders on the same side, you know? But yeah, I guess I could. Yeah, we'll just slide that over. Set it at 550. And I did notice that, you know, you don't need to put a lot of tension on those set screws, just enough to hold it. I mean, it's, it's not like exactly it's wiggling right. around or blowing anywhere, so just enough to, to hold it there. Okay, hit next. Recognition camera axis adjustment is complete. Well, congratulations, Pete. You just completed your first successful static calibration, but you're not done yet. A successful calibration does not necessarily mean an accurate calibration. So this vehicle needs to be test driven. And I'm not talking about a quick test drive around the block. You need to take the vehicle out for an extensive test drive to exercise the lane departure warning system to ensure it's operating properly. And only then do you bring the vehicle back to shop and perform your post scan. Oh, that's excellent, George. I'm glad you brought that point up because that's something that we talk about all the time, verify your repair. So equally important if you're going to fool with any of the ADOS systems on the vehicle, whether it's performing a calibration or making a repair. So thanks for that, George. And thanks so much for you taking the time to join me today and share your knowledge of ADOS. I think we have some time for a few questions. Let's see. Uh, uh, Let's see what they are. Excellent. And I got to tell you, man, with you, you, you guys, it's not only not the question, but many of you guys made a point here. And in all fairness to my mentor, George, he wasn't able to actually see me performing the process as he was listening to me perform the process. And, and you caught me. You caught me. Hey, it didn't say to turn the headlights off. Of course, the headlights on the Corolla are on. You all saw it pass the calibration phase. Let's see if George can give us some insight on why I was able to, to make that happen with the headlights on. Maybe to my mind, it's so low that it was below the range of the target. Uh, but what insights do you have, George, on performing, uh, accidentally leaving the headlights on during procedure like this? Would it have failed otherwise? Okay. Yeah, th there's really two reasons behind turning the headlights off. One you just touched on, and that's um, by providing glare on the target which yes, your headlights were lower and it, that wasn't a problem. The other is simply maintaining battery life. So if you didn't have a battery maintainer and left the headlights on, there's a lot of vehicles that uh, you wouldn't have gotten through the calibration. Very good, okay. And the next one is specific to the Maxi system. What kind of setup and hands-on training is offered by Autel for customers purchasing either of the two major systems? Sure, this is a very common question. So most of the uh, setup and training is supposed to be dis uh, provided by the distributor the customer purchases from. However, Autel has begun building an ADOS training team and we have training in a couple of different formats. One, we're going to continue doing more and more webinars like this, and we're going to get uh, much more in-depth into ADOS technology, uh, how the systems work, how the sensors work, 
uh, actual calibrations on a variety of different vehicles, as well as uh, calibration troubleshooting. So look forward to those in the coming weeks. Wonderful, we have uh, a series of instructor-led training classes that we normally do in groups. And when we can, we don't normally provide end user training one-on-one. -on -one. When we can, if we have an instructor in the area, we, you know, we work with our distributors to provide that level of support as well. Yeah, awesome. And again, at the end of the webcast, we'll be putting up a slide that gives you some contact information so that you can reach out directly to Autel to learn more. Uh, the next one, I'm going to give a shot for this one here, George. The question is, how can I know that the camera position is in the correct place? Are there any tools or is there any tools that can make sure of that? And I think the question has to go with installing the OEM camera back to where it's supposed to go. And in most of these cases, it's probably a, a pretty secure fit in the general area. What you're concerned about, and I think what I would be concerned about, is that quote unquote silly millimeter that the camera is off once it is reinstalled. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, for the most part, it, it's about ensuring that the camera is snapped completely and totally into the bracket. Uh, in some cases, uh, vehicles may use a gel pad between the camera and the windshield, and that gel pad can get worn, get flattened out, so that may need to be replaced. There are some vehicle manufacturers, uh, Volvo and uh, Fiat Chrysler off the top of my head, that use a little uh, measuring jig to measure the level of the uh, camera in its bracket, and it can be adjusted for proper fit. And I think the next one too, I think I can handle them. We'll give it a shot based on all the information that I learned today. And that question is, I saw that remove and replace a bumper calls for calibration, but that, does that also apply if you just R and I that cover a part? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say if, if the radar camera or the radar units included or mounted to that bumper, Absolutely, you, you have to do the calibration. Correct, if the, if the radar is attached to the bumper and the bumper is removed and installed, of course, but there are still many OEMs that say, even with chassis mounted radar sensors, if you remove the bumper cover and reinstall it, that you should calibrate. Uh, sometimes it's about positioning because that radar sensor is very sensitive to the material type and the thickness of material. So if you change the position of the bumper, you may throw off uh, some of those values that would require recalibration. All right, and uh, I think the last one we're gonna be able to get in today, folks, If and this is a good, really good question. If you have a fixed axle truck or other vehicle for that matter, and the thrust angle um, is off and the calibration is required, what steps do you need to take to calibrate? Is this something obviously didn't come from the factory with the severe thrust angle issue. What, what would you recommend in that case, George? That's actually a, another very common question, and it really comes back to the OEM procedures. Uh, if that vehicle manufacturer says that the vehicle needs to be properly aligned, you have to do what you have to do to get that thrust angle as close to zero as possible. If um, that vehicle manufacturer, let's say for instance, it's a, a dynamic only calibration, they probably have software to be able to compensate for that. Okay, and, and I would kind of, uh, an example I use is we all have seen a vehicle that's dog tracking down the road, right? It, it's going in a straight line as far as the lane's concerned, but it looks like it's pointed physically, and it is, right, to the left or the right because of that variance in the thrust line. Exactly right, right. So it, and that's where the camera and the radar are now aiming. Are now aiming off to the side. So again, it yes. all goes back to just considering that the camera and radar units of the vehicle are the eyes of the vehicle, and if they don't have 20-20 vision, the various active safety systems that are involved on the vehicle are not going to be able to function as they are. Uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking George Lesniak from Autel so much for taking the time to be with us today. I thank you for being here with us today. And I wish you and yours all the best, safe, uh, healthy, uh, get through this, uh, this unique time in our history together. And we'll see you next time on Motor Age Webinars.